There we go, that's better. All right. Two, three, four, five. Excuse my feet here, they really look bad, but uh, just to illustrate the point. Two, three, four, five. Well, that's really nice, isn't it? Okay. Here we have gold. All right. What is that? Ancient Babylon. Okay, next we have, get my thing here, arms. Okay, arms and chest of silver. Now, what's the kingdom that came after Babylon? kingdom that came after Babylon is the Persian okay next we have the uh, let's see how it's worded here I want to make sure I get this right belly and his thighs of brass okay so there you have brass what is that? Well, there you have the Greek, the Greece, Kingdom of Greece, with the world ruler, Alexander the Great, basically. Next, you have the legs of iron. And what do we have there? Roman. The Eastern and the Western, branches of the Roman Empire. That's what you have there. Next, we have down here, the Fifth Kingdom, we have ten toes, like the ten kings in the book of Revelation. And they are iron and clay. Now, a lot of people are trying to say, a lot of prophecy teachers will say, these four kingdoms have come and gone. But now there's a space between this kingdom and this kingdom. I don't teach that. I don't believe that. I believe that this tenth king or this fifth kingdom, the ten toes here, I believe this fifth kingdom has been around since the fall of the Roman Empire back in, you know, essentially like the fourth century, I believe, is about when that fell. And what happened though? Well, you have iron, see so it goes gold to silver to brass to, to iron. The metals are changing. But here you have iron becoming iron and clay. You see, it doesn't go away. It just changes, it morphs a little bit. So what do we have down here? The fifth kingdom would be Roman Catholicism. I think I'll spell it here. Roman Catholicism. That's the fifth kingdom. And they have retained some strong and some weak control over the centuries. Back during the Dark Ages, they were in total control of the nations of Europe and most of the world, too. Then, with the Reformation years, uh, they relinquished some of their control. Uh, there were some Christian men that, that rose up within quote-unquote Protestantism. I think most of the leaders of the Protestant movement were had many issues. Again, I've talked about that in other studies. But you did have some men that, that rose up under the banner of Protestant that actually fought off the Catholics. The best known, of course, would be Oliver Cromwell and uh, guys like this that, that basically pushed the Roman Catholic political, the temporal power, back. And so you had some freedom in this time. There wasn't a total dictatorship the whole way through the fifth kingdom. But it's going to be in the future. Again, they're going to have control. 
But see, how does it work out if you're just saying, well, the Antichrist is going to be a Jewish, false Jewish Messiah and not connected to Roman Catholicism? He has to be connected to Roman Catholicism. He has to be. Just as simple as that. But I want to show you something very interesting. What did we read earlier about Judas Iscariot? One of you is a devil. Look at this interesting thing here that Daniel says in verse 43. Daniel chapter uh, 2 verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Interesting. Could it be that some of the high-ranking uh, officials within Roman Catholicism are actually devils? You know, you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read uh, the history of the Waldensians, you read some of the stuff in the, that these Catholics are doing to, to Christians and, you know, going after Jews as well, you know, and uh, they're going out there and they're murdering and slaughtering and just doing all this horrible stuff. I mean, I remember reading the one Waldensian book. They, they were, they came into the where the Waldensians lived and, and they were actually killing Waldensians and eating the brains of the Waldensians while they were still alive. Cutting the top of their head off and while they're there laying there dying, they were eating the brains out. These Roman Catholic soldiers. You're not dealing with people. You're dealing with devils. And I believe in the highest levels, I mean, there are some Catholic priests that will get saved and whatever else, some Jesuits that could get saved. But I think when you get up into the highest levels, you're dealing with devils. A devil. That's what you're dealing with. That's what we read about there in that prophecy. In Daniel chapter 2. Let's read verse 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings shall the God of, of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it, that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. You say, wait a second, though. That doesn't make any sense because, you see, all five kingdoms that have to be there for this image to come down and smite it and everything falls apart. No, because, you see, the Roman Catholics are just the ones who are in control of this ancient system that's set up. And that's why you, when you study Roman Catholicism, you'll see that a lot of their practices date back to the ancient Babylonian system. The Baal worshippers are doing the same thing. They're baking quakes, cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Offering drinks, offerings and, and bread and all this other stuff. And they have priests called Father and they have vestments and all this other stuff. It's this system right there. The Pope is the modern head of it. And, uh, you know, he's a man of peace. And yet he comes to America here just a little while ago. In September, he came to America and uh, never once preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he blasphemed the Lord Jesus, calling him a failure. Humanly speaking, his death on the cross was a failure. His life ended in failure. He's a blasphemer. Hmm. Very interesting. Let's look at a couple other things. Characteristics of the Antichrist. First of all, he is a world military leader. You say, well, it can't be the Pope because the Pope is a, you know, he's just leader of the, the church. Yeah, but when you study Roman Catholicism, they believe that they have both the spiritual and the temporal power. He runs the world governments. Definitely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, when you get President of the United States and other world leaders and they're coming over and they're bowing to him and stuff like this, maybe that should give you a sign. You know, when he goes to the UK a few years ago, they lower the British flag and put up the Vatican flag. Maybe that should be a little indication that he's actually more than just a religious leader. Global worship. Another attribute of the Antichrist that we read about. Global worship. Let me give you some scripture references too here that you can write down for this. First of all, up here you have Revelation 
6 and 13. You can read those two chapters there, Revelation chapter 6. He is the open, the first seal, and then he comes out. He goes forth conquering and the conquer. Revelation 13 talks about, you know, who's able to make war with the beast, you know, and everything. And also, back in the book of Daniel, you can read it too. It ties in global worship. Of course, you have Revelation 13. Again, let's look at another attribute. How about no desire for women? You say, well, where did you get that from? Daniel chapter 11, verse 37. You can read it there. Nor the desire for women. Or the desire of women, I think it says, or whatever. In other words, he doesn't regard the God of his fathers, and he doesn't have the desire of women. Okay? And you know, people say, what about that? Uh, he doesn't regard the God of his fathers. He has to be a Jew. Because uh, then he doesn't regard the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, well, there's another religious leader that uh, calls his uh, former popes fathers. Holy Father, you know. He can also fill that position. How about uh, changing times and laws? You say, where do you read that? Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. 7, 25. Look it up. This king of fierce countenance, this man that comes in the end times, he changes times and laws. What did the Pope do back centuries ago? I think it was Pope, Pope Gregory, I think it was. He redid the calendar. We really have no idea what year it is right now because of what a Pope did century, centuries ago. Excuse me. How about serving a false god? As I mentioned earlier, serving A false god, lowercase g, <laughs> serving a false god, Daniel 11, 37 again. Isn't it interesting that the last couple of years the popes have been saying Easter Masses to Lucifer? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, if you have a King James Bible, the correct translation there, Lucifer. And they say, well, that, it's just a reference to Jesus. You know, Jesus is, uh, you know, the bright morning star. Or Lucifer is the bright morning star. It's just the same. Well, then why did they say Christos Philios Tus? Christ is your son. How could Lucifer be Jesus Christ when Christ is his son? Uh-uh. You see, they're already saying masses to the Antichrist. Lucifer. They worship the dragon. They worship the man who the dragon has given his power and his seat and great authority. You see how it all works out? Christ is the son of Lucifer, according to a Catholic. Which Christ are they talking about? Another place in the Bible talks about the Lord and his Christ. The devil has a Christ. And he's going to be showing up. I believe that's what he's going to be looking like. My little drawing here. Next we have... Connected to witchcraft. You say, what? What are you talking about? What? Huh? The Pope connected to witchcraft? What do you mean? Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. You say, what? It doesn't say witchcraft. It shall cause craft to prosper in his hands. Okay? Talking about craft prospering in his hand. You say, well, that, that doesn't necessarily mean witchcraft. What do you think it is? You think he's going to be making baskets or something? You know? <laughs> no. Craft there is talking about witchcraft. And you say, but, you know, I don't understand. Well, if you've seen my wife's study on that, uh, she did a study and, and she shows uh, her big chart that she made. Lord help her to make it. And um, there's a lot of tentacles to witchcraft. And ironically, the... In the New Testament, the same word is used 
that's the use the word that's used for witchcraft is the same word that underlies our modern word uh, pharmaceutical. And of course, you look at the the Vatican tie-ins with the pharmaceutical industry and everything else, and a lot of the other tentacles of witchcraft. The Vatican is in control of a lot of that stuff. In fact, all of it, really. So again, he's connected to witchcraft. He'll cause craft to prosper in his hand. And isn't it ironic? Um, the mark of the beast is going to be an, an implantable microchip of some sort. Uh, I do believe that because Revelation chapter 13 in the King James Bible says that the mark will be in the right hand or in the forehead. Now, who would be the type that would administer a thing like that? The government? Technically, yes. But where are they going to administer it at? Did you get your flu shot? Uh, why don't you stop by your local pharmacy? Your local witchcraft center. I mean, the Greek word pharmaceutical, there are pharmakia, is the same word for pharmaceutical, same word for witchcraft. So you're going to have a uh, craft prospering in his hand? In his right hand? How many people are going to be taking that mark in their right hand? Given out by the pharmaceutical, the pharmacist? Whew. Gets a little weird after a while, doesn't it? How about a blasphemer? Again, we read about that earlier in Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. Revelation 13, verse 6 talks about he's blaspheming God. Exactly like the Pope did, Pope Francis did. Hmm. Sits on a throne. Exactly like the Pope does currently. That would be in 2 Thessalonians, as well as other places, by the way. But 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 4. Right there. Again, um, is a Jewish Messiah going to show up and sit on a throne and the whole world's going to worship him? Really? If the Pope can do it, does it all the time. And more and more and more people are worshiping the Pope. Well, he's a great man, don't you know? He's very, very good. I, I, did you hear his speech? It was so uplifting. It was so nice. He's such a, a great man of peace. Finally, we have, he's a great orator. In other words, he can make great orations, great speeches with uh, great words and everything else. Very impressive. Daniel 11 and Revelation 13. Tying him in again with uh, King Herod. The great order. Hmm. Now again, I have to ask you the question. You mean to tell me the Pope can fill all of these characteristics of the Antichrist right now, but he's not going to be the Antichrist? Sorry, I don't believe that. You say, but uh, the Jews would never accept him. Oh, uh, what did they say when they rejected Jesus Christ? Pilate comes out and he says, Behold your king! Here's Jesus. I mean, he just did all these years, three and a half years of ministry, sign after sign after sign after sign, healing the blind, raising the dead, doing all these things, fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. And by the way, you know, the Jews, I know the Jews, one of their big arguments will be they say, well, he didn't fulfill all of the, all of the prophecies of the Old Testament because he didn't bring in the kingdom and he didn't do all this stuff. Uh, those are at the second coming, first of all. Okay, um, but the, the fact of the matter is Jesus Christ was rejected by the nation of Israel. And you see that back in the Old Testament. Again, I have that in my other study, you know. So to say, well, he had to fulfill everything the first time, you're just ignorant of Scripture. You're showing your ignorance of Scripture. Jesus Christ is going to fulfill all of the requirements of the Messiah, 
but it is only going to be after the time of Jacob's trouble. He came first as the king of the Jews. They rejected him. And ironically, what did they say? Pontius Pilate, here's your king. We have no king but Caesar, the Roman, two legs of iron that comes down to Roman Catholicism. Caesar, who is Caesar? Your modern day Caesar is right there, the Pope. Don't tell me that the Jews would not accept him as their Messiah in the time of Jacob's trouble. You see, because there's going to be some real major confusion that's going to happen in that time period. And a lot of people are going to think, well, hey, there's this bad stuff that happened. And we've made it through the time of Jacob's trouble. Now we're into the Messianic age. This guy showed up, you know, this Pope. He's here. He's got a throne in Jerusalem. He's a great guy. He's, he's going out and he's... He's attacking this and he's attacking that. And it's just wonderful. I mean, he's this great servant of the Lord and everything. And uh, I think he's the Messiah. Don't tell me that there wouldn't be Jews that would fall for this guy. There are some that already do. Again, I showed you the, the rabbi accepted a Catholic knighthood. I mean, it's just right there. But another argument that comes up and they'll say, but I don't understand, okay? How could the beast be the Pope when the beast turns on the whore, the harlot of Revelation chapter 17, that mystery Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. So how could the beast turn against the Roman Catholic Church? That doesn't make sense. Let's look at that. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 16 and 18, or 16 through 18, it says here, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Not the beast himself, but the ten horns, the ten guys that are under his authority. And shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Okay? Let me give you another little illustration here. You know, how could the Antichrist turn against the Roman Catholic Church if the Antichrist is the Pope? Well, very simple. Adolf Hitler spent years and years and years drumming up German patriotism. A lot of the Nazi songs that were sung were just German folk songs. They have nothing to do with uh, hating the Jewish people um, or, you know, you know, despising, you know, or trying to bring in a new world order or something like that. They're just German folk music, some of them hundreds of years old. And Adolf Hitler did all this thing, you know, the Germany, 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 Germany. Towards the end of the war, he could care less about Germany. And I remember there was even a quote I heard where he was basically like, if the German people don't want to fight for me, then I don't care what happens to them. What happened to all the German patriotism? He was using them. If you think that the Pope really cares about Roman Catholics and really cares about the system and individual Catholics, you are quite foolish. Just as the devil could care less about the people that follow him. You know, Jesus says to the Pharisees of his day, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. But you see, there's no love between the two. Satan doesn't love his children. He is king of all, over all the children of pride, but he doesn't love them. It's not the same relationship that God has for his children. Okay, so for the Antichrist, his rulers there, the ten kings, to turn against Roman Catholicism and destroy him, he wouldn't care. He has no loyal, loyalty to it. Catholicism is just, uh, you know, I remember one of the popes said, uh, how profitable the fable of Christ has been to us. So these guys don't even believe what they profess. It's all, you know, behind the scenes, the Pope is a military political ruler that's got so much money that make your head spin. Okay, uh, and then they go out and they beg in for money and we want to help the poor and all that. It's all just fake, completely fake. He doesn't care anything at all about that. It's all just a show that they put on. All right, so don't, don't give me that thing. But let me show you another verse here. I forgot to go to this one earlier. But uh, an interesting thing here, see if I can find the verse. 
verse 8. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. And here's another little argument for this thing of it being this devil spirit, Apollyon or Abaddon, depending on which one you want to say they're Hebrew or Greek. But this devil that was Judas Iscariot that died, went to his own place, and I believe is going to come back and indwell. He'll be the spirit that indwells this man of sin. Look at this. And you can, you know, interpret this different ways. I'm just giving you my interpretation. It says here, verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. You say, wait a second. That's very confusing, isn't it? Okay. Let's see here. See if I can write it up here. He was, he is not, yet is. Huh? What is this? Look at this. He was Judas Iscariot. Well, as you say, then he's uh, Judas Iscariot now, reincarnated kind of a deal. No, because he is not. He was Judas Iscariot. He is not. Right now, he is not Judas Iscariot. He was Judas Iscariot. The devil that first was here on the earth, there where Jesus says, have not I chosen you twelve and one of you as a devil? Interesting too because uh, twelve and one is thirteen. And Judas Iscariot, the name Judas Iscariot, has thirteen letters in it. Purely coincidental, I'm sure. He was Judas Iscariot. He is not Judas Iscariot now in this time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. And yet, he is. He is a devil. Apollyon Abaddon. He was Judas Iscariot. He is not currently Judas Iscariot. And yet he is in the sense that it's the same devil running both. I believe that that's the proper interpretation of this verse. And you can get into a lot more of this stuff. Again, this we go off in a whole another study. But you see, I believe that what this guy is going to be, I believe that he is going to be that same devil spirit that was there. But now think about this. If Judas Iscariot was a Syrian Jew, which he was, he was a man of Kiriath, he was, you know, somewhat had some uh, Moabite, you know, in him. And you say, well, then that's what he has to be now. He has to be that as the Antichrist, the Messiah for the Jews, the false Messiah and whatever else. Uh, yeah, but the problem is there. The text says he was Judas Iscariot, but he is not. Judas Iscariot, and yet he is the same spirit. So he could very easily be the spirit, Apollyon Abaddon, but indwelling the body of a Gentile Pope. You say, why a Gentile? Because the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron were all run by Gentiles. We have no king but Caesar. Do you get it? But now let me finish up here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. What is the conclusion of the matter? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, 
with all power and signs and lying wonders. I mean, you just really got to watch all the different studies that I've done. Uh, it all ties together, all this different stuff. But you see the key word there. We have in uh, verse 7, what's the key word? Very important for our study. Right there is your key word. Mystery. This man is a mystery. Paul is teaching that we are the ones that are letting, we are the ones that are hindering this man from showing up. If this man showed up, this Antichrist, uh, whoever he's going to be, if he showed up right now, all the Christian websites, all the Christian ministries out there would be examining the guy. I mean, you see people doing it already. You know, there's already people trying to tell who the Antichrist is going to be and everything as far as particular men on the earth. And I don't say Pope Francis, you know, I think he's too old. I don't think, I think he's just another temporary Pope that they're waiting till the body of Christ leaves and then they can bring out the real guy. Um, he does fulfill all of these over here, but I don't believe that he's going to be the Antichrist. But you see, the reality of it is, for us as a Christian, this man and his identity is a mystery. And I don't care how good a Bible teacher you are or how many degrees you have or how much learning or education, whatever else, it's still going to be a mystery. And uh, you say, well, then you don't believe that the Antichrist is going to be Jewish. Um, I would say no, but uh, could, could there be a surprise? Could he come out and not be a Gentile and actually be a, a Syrian Jew or something? I don't know. It's a possibility. But you see, if I stick with that and that only and say he has to be a Syrian Jew, if another pope shows up, like this guy, and he is the man, I don't want to let Jews that watch these videos, I don't want to let them, and they don't, they don't get saved in time for the rapture, and they're here, I don't want them to think, well, he's a good guy, you know, we're still looking for the Jewish Messiah, but, you know, we'll just kind of go along with his system, because... The Christians said that it couldn't be the Antich or the, the Pope couldn't be the Antichrist. I don't want that. I believe this is your man right there. Whatever he's going to be, he could be a Gentile, or the reality of it is, I think there's a possibility if they wanted to play this thing out, he could also be Jewish. Put a little beard on him. Jewish Pope. I took his shoulder out there. You know, I probably can't see this here too good on the camera, but my wife drew IHS up here, you know, on his little uh, miter, his little uh, Dagon fish hat up there. IHS means, does not mean, you know, I forget what they say in the Catholic thing, but uh, it's, the reality of it is, it's Isis Horus Zeb is what it means, S-E-B. Zeb. But uh, they try to say it means something else, you know, in hoc signo or something like this, you know. But uh, no, it means Isis, Isis horse Zeb. But uh, there's an also a, a mitre that he wears sometimes which says Vicarious Philly D. And you look at the Roman numerals within that, it adds up to 666. Another interesting thing, you know, the throne of, of Peter that the Pope will sit on a lot of times has an upside down inverted cross on it. You'll see the Pope sitting there. All kinds of weird stuff. There's your man of sin right there. If he comes and he's a Jew, somehow a Syrian Jew, they're going to give him the title of Pope. If we leave, Pope Francis, I believe, is going to step down and, and make way for the next Pope to come. He could be a Gentile. He could be a Jew. I don't know. I cannot be certain. I cannot be dogmatic. The, the, as a Bible-believing Christian in, in this time that we call the church age, uh, and I know the term church, I know some people have written this, they say, well, church was used about the church in the wilderness in the Old Testament. Church is, just means called out assembly, you know, so I know you can get technical with that, you know, and stuff and say, well, church, you know, whatever. But uh, what I'm referring to is the time of the body of Christ, the time from the crucifixion up until the rapture. 
That's the body of Christ. There were transitional times within that early part of the book of Acts, um, but they're saved, okay? People that were before Paul were in Christ. Romans chapter 16 talks about that. Don't fall for the hyper-dispensational thing. But whoever this guy is, one thing is crystal clear. He will sit in this office that has existed the whole way through the fifth kingdom. The fifth kingdom of Roman Catholicism has been in effect since for the last essentially 1700 years, we'll say. 1700 years, this kingdom has been in effect run by Caesar, Pontificus Maximus, the Pope. He will be your world ruler. He is the man who is a world military leader according to official Catholic doctrine. Okay, I'm not making that up. The temporal power means he has the power of the sword, both the spiritual and the physical sword. All the kings of the world bow down to the Pope. Okay? He is getting global worship more and more as time goes by. And he definitely will get it after the, the body of Christ leaves. He has no desire for women. I believe that Pope Francis, as well as the other popes, I believe that Pope Francis is a satanic ritual abuse uh, practitioner. Uh, committing sacrifices with small children and things like that. You have to get to get to his level. You have to be a very sick individual. Okay, I know that uh, there's a guy Kevin Annette that that uh, saw some of that. He was worked with uh, Native American people up in British Columbia, and it just a Holocaust up there, just slaughtering hundreds of thousands of little Native children and things in these Catholic-run schools, totally covered up by the Catholic Church. I mean, just Catholicism is the most satanic system on the planet. There's nothing more satanic than Catholicism. It all stems back to that. But sodomy is just, it's, it's not even an epidemic. It's a way of life with the Catholic hierarchy. And again, why? Because they are devils. I believe that a lot of the high up guys in Catholicism are actually devils. We read about that in Daniel chapter 2. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not cleave one to another. I believe these guys are devils, just like Judas Iscariot. Changing times and laws. The Pope does that. Okay? Pope Gregory. Change the calendar. Certainly he can come out and change times and laws. Serving a false god. As I stated, they're already doing Easter Masses to Lucifer. You know? That's not a god that the popes in the past would have talked about. So those fathers, the god of his fathers. See? You say, but it could be the Jews too. It could be the Jews. I don't know. It may be kind of weird to roll out a Jewish pope, you know, and I think you'd have a lot of Muslims that would rather die than worship the guy. But if you have a Catholic pope, especially if they bring in some young guy, you know, some young guy that uh, is attractive and whatever else, you know, is sodomy. By the way, that's another thing interesting uh, that sodomy used to be, you know, the Bible talks about effeminate, but there's a new group of sodomites out there that uh, they are, they're not effeminate so much as they are very, very militant and sadistic. Uh, kind of like what you saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were, you know, the angels come in and, the, and these Sodomites gather around Lot's home and they're like, send them out that we may know them. They were going to gang rape two angels. Yeah, that's a good idea, you know. <laughs> that would have been bad. You know, the angels would have just slaughtered them. Instead of just stri striking them with blindness, they would have, I mean, it would have been bad news for those Sodomites. But the point is, those guys were violent Sodomites. I actually saw one the one time. My brother-in-law and I were going fishing down when I was still in Pennsylvania, and we're walking along, and I saw these two sodomites, very clearly sodomites, and the one, he just glared at me. Just like devil-possessed, just like glaring at me as I was walking by, and I was like, okay, you know, we're just going fishing, man, you know, whatever. I mean, it's weird, weird. Violent sodomite, Vol violent sodomites. No desire for women. How about uh, serving a false god? We went over that connected to witchcraft. The Vatican is very much connected to witchcraft. Can you hand me your poster there real quick? I want to show that real quick again. Blasphemer. The Pope just blasphemed the Lord just a month ago in September. Let me show you my, my wife's poster here the Lord helped her to make just to show you the thing of, of witchcraft. If you haven't seen her study... Um, very good study on witchcraft and 
witchcraft and it's tied to all this stuff here. You have the pharmaceuticals, spiritism, psychics, society of Jesus, the Vatican, child pornography, uh, Phoenix bird, ominism, animism, uh, pantheism, dualism, shamanism, all this different stuff. You know, you can watch her study on that. She gets into a lot more detail with the thing, but just, just absolutely incredible all that witchcraft is tied to. You know, again, the Pope is tied right into that whole system. He sits on a throne. He already sits on a throne. He's got a throne that they're setting up in Jerusalem. I mean, wake up, people. It's just right there in front of you. And he's a great orator. He comes in peaceably. I would like to address Congress. I thank the people of America that they would invite me to such a wonderful place. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Guy's a snake. A total snake. A devil walking around in the flesh is what the Pope is. And the final Pope is going to be the Antichrist. Whether he's a Syrian Jew or whether he's a Gentile. I can't say for sure. Hey, half of the men that typify the Antichrist are Gentiles, half are Jews. Or at least part Jews, like Balak. You know? But to get dogmatic and to say definitely he has to be he has to be a Jew that that matches the messianic prophecies and things like that, you can't match the messianic prophecies. That's impossible. Again, I explain that in my study, how that the Jeconiah, the line of Jeconiah has been cut off. Nobody from that line, which goes back to David, nobody from that can sit on the throne. But Jesus Christ being born of Mary, adopted by Joseph, it works out. Again, I've proved it. I showed the proof. So you say, well, okay, if it's all a mystery to us as Christians, if we can't possibly know, then why even bother doing this study? Well, <laughs> because there are people that are going to see this thing after the body of Christ leaves. And there might be some Jews, and I'm very, very aware of that, that there might be some Jews that were drawn into this study because about accepting a Gentile Messiah. And, you know, if you're really, truly looking for truth, you're still watching. If you're more interested in the things of this world and, and you don't really care what the Bible says, Scripture, even the Old Testament, if you just want to go with the Old Testament, a lot of this stuff is right there in the Old Testament. You know, most of this is Old Testament right here. So I'm very aware of the fact that there are Jews that watch this ministry, and I'm, I thank the Lord for that. And what you need to know is there's your enemy. Roman Catholicism is the greatest enemy of the Jews. Roman Catholicism has never been Christianity. You can read the New Testament. There's not one mention, not one mention of Roman Catholicism, of a pope, of nuns or monks or Eucharist or transubstantiation or any of that satanic nonsense. You're dealing with this ancient system prophesied by Daniel. That's what you're dealing with. You need to stay away from Roman Catholicism. When the body of Christ leaves, and the body of Christ will leave, before this man is revealed, when we leave, watch out, stay away from Roman Catholicism. Get away from the Pope. You say, well, uh, isn't there a way out of this? Oh, absolutely. Come to Jesus Christ as your Messiah right now. You say, but, but I have questions and things. Listen to me. You're going to have questions, all right? Uh, there are people that are going to question you and question you and question you to try and put doubts into your mind. But you see, I know the system of Judaism. I've been studying it now for a while. And I know that there is no sacrifice to pay for your sins. You have to try and think to yourself, well, maybe if I have a male heir, he can pray me out of it and I'll be uh, worthy enough to get into the resurrection. And when the Messiah comes, I'll be resurrected and all this other stuff. Uh, you better get a better hope than that. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ did fulfill the requirements of the Messiah. He just did not fulfill, he didn't bring in the kingdom because he was rejected by the Jews of his day. Don't reject him now. All right? Because really, all Judaism has right now is not much different than this over here. They believe, Roman Catholics, I'm not talking the Pope, he's a, he's a devil, okay? Roman Catholics believe that they're going to do good works and get themselves into God's good favor, get into heaven. That's exactly what a lot of Jews believe. When you reject Jesus Christ, all you have to rely on is yourself. But uh, you need to come to the place where you realize, 
Uh, you need to drop the self-righteous pride. You're a sinner. You can't please God. You can't live a life that is perfect and sinless before God. You can't do it. Jesus Christ was the only one that could. Why? He was God manifest in the flesh. Was and is God manifest in the flesh. And you will see him if you go into this time period and you don't take the mark and you somehow survive because you managed to avoid this guy and his army. You're going to see Jesus Christ as your Messiah one day. I mean, think about this. You say, oh, it's all just delusion. Oh, <laughs> stupid Christian. Stupid Christians by the millions down through the years. This man, Jesus Christ, comes, dies on the cross, turns the world upside down. It's all fake. Do you really believe that? Are you that deceived? The thousands and thousands and thousands of hymns. Fanny Crosby, a blind woman, and she writes all these hymns praising Jesus Christ. It was all a delusion. It was all fake. Really? And yet there are a lot of Jews that leave Judaism. And I realize you could say, well, there's the Christians that leave Christianity. They've never been truly saved. You're not going to have real true Christians quit on Jesus Christ. I've never seen it. Real true Christians will get into sin. Real true Christians will mess up. They'll get messed up doctrinally. They'll, they'll you know, whatever. But they'll never deny Jesus Christ. I've never seen it. And yet I've seen Jews that say, ah, and they turn away from Judaism. Why? <laughs> what does it have to offer you? A do-gooder religion with the hope of maybe making it into the resurrection. I'd put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what you ought to do. You say, I think I'm going to wait. I had, a, I had a Jew write to me the one time and he said, uh, your Bible says that we're blinded. So how could we be blamed for something when we're blinded? Um, the fact that you're writing to me proves to me that you're not blind anymore. The fact that God brought you to this channel to watch a video like this and to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're not blind. You're looking for the truth. Why else would you have watched this study? The truth is Jesus Christ. He is truth personified. Check it out. Hey, get a New Testament read it. And you show me where it's anti-Jewish. You say, well, it says that the Jews killed Jesus. They did. They did. Well, then, then that means that they hate the, you know, we're supposed to, the, the New Testament teaches hatred of the Jews. Show me a verse that teaches that. To all you Jews out there that reject the Bible, you say, it's replacement theology. It teaches replacement theology. Show me a verse where it says that I, as a Christian, am supposed to hate the Jews. Show it to me. I can show you, and I did show you at the beginning of this study, where Paul says, I could wish that myself were accursed for my brethren, for my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. I had somebody write me one of these uh, replacement theology papists over here, and he said, you seem to think that the Jews have some kind of an advantage, you know, that they, they're somehow better than just a, a Gentile and things like this. And uh, that, that's ridiculous. That's heresy. I said, oh, really? Turn your Bible to Romans chapter 3. Verse 1, what advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The New Testament does prefer the Jews over the Gentiles. They have an advantage. Don't let your advantage slip by and you miss the rapture and you go into this time period where this guy shows up. And then you have to endure to the end to be saved. And, you know, you will see then. And that's what this Jewish guy wrote to me. He said, well, he said, I'll just wait. He said, I'm going to wait till I can see the proof of the New Testament. Bad idea. I mean, if I could go back in time and say to those Jews in Germany, this guy, this Adolf Hitler, uh, you don't want to trust him. He's a bad man. He's going to kill lots of you, millions of you. Um, and I could show them the proof. Don't you think a lot of them would say, I, I think I want to leave Germany? Well, you have a chance right now, if you're Jewish, you have a chance to leave before this man shows up. He's the one that's persecuted you, by the way. The Romans, Roman Catholicism, they murdered your Savior. Okay? And by the way, it was the Jews that went to Pilate to have Jesus killed. 
But Pilate disobeyed the Roman laws to crucify Jesus. There's no charge. There's no, he's innocent. Then you let him go. Well, the popular opinion, popular opinion doesn't matter when you live by the law. So it wasn't all the Jews that killed Jesus. Yes, they were the ones who wanted Jesus dead because of the leaders. Again, the people were very much for Jesus until their leaders, their rabbis, look out for those guys, until their doctors of the law turn them against Jesus Christ. Be careful when you get a Christ-hating rabbi. He'll turn you against Jesus Christ. He'll get your mind all confused with questions and questions and questions and questions. Just like Tobias Singer. I'm watching some of his videos, it's obvious he hates Jesus Christ. You know, oh, I don't hate Christians. I don't hate Jesus. And Yes, you do. Stinking liar, are you? Give me a break. But, you know, these guys, they'll turn you against Jesus Christ with all their questions and questions and questions. And their questions can be answered from the New Testament, by the way, too. I should add that. And he's a liar. I mean, I can prove that. But the point is, if these guys turn you against Jesus, you're going to end up crucifying him in your mind and saying, he's not my Messiah. I don't want anything to do with him. And then they say, uh, we have no king but uh, Caesar. And if you're not careful, you'll end up taking his mark. And if you do, Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11 says, you take that mark, you worship the beast, you worship him. You go to hell without any chance of getting out. God's chosen people, seed of Abraham, you could be of the tribe of Levi. I mean, you could, all the greatest of everything. You could be a descendant of David. Doesn't matter. You take this mark that this guy offers, you go to hell and you burn forever. You better make the right decision. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know how much longer the church is going to be here, the body of Christ. Not Catholicism, but I don't know how much longer the body of Christ is going to be here. I mean, there's still some stragglers that need to be saved. But when that time comes, we're leaving. And when we leave, the floodgates are going to open. The mystery of iniquity is going to come onto the scene. And by the way, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 also says that it's actually God that sends strong delusion. And like I said, here's your strong delusion. This man that professes to be a, the leader of Christianity. He's not. And I think that there could be a very real possibility that he could show up or there could be a younger Pope that would come and have a beard and look like Jesus. That's a possibility. I don't know. I have no idea. Again, I'm not going to be here. So, uh, it's a very important study. Lots of things to go over. I hope you can see a lot of this stuff here, but... Um, just really wanted to put this thing together uh, for the Jewish people, uh, but also to clear up some of the confusion among the brethren. Um, this, this office of the Pope has always been fulfilling all these requirements of the Antichrist. Okay, um, And that's why when you read your New Testament, there are a lot of times when you'll see it's like there's really no, like, well, it's not going to be, the rapture's not going to be for a long time out into the future. I mean, it's, it's imminent. There is the imminency of the rapture. And, you know, the Lord could come back. I mean, Pope could uh, Pope Francis could get old and die and, and we could still be here in a couple years and things. And, and I have no idea, really. All I know is what I'm supposed to do and that is I'm supposed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am a minister of reconciliation. So are you if you're saved. So, Let's get those last people saved so we can get out of here. And uh, if you're going to wait around, you say, I'm a Jew and I'm going to wait around to see this proof that the New Testament's true. Um, you're going to have problems. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, please keep us in your prayers.